The Cellar. It was two days before Christmas in 2010. A 39-year-old man from Murdashaw named Alan Catterall was hard at work cleaning machinery at Piranha Moldings. To give some more details, Murdashaw, where Alan lived, is located on the southern edge of Runcorn, Newtown. Runcorn is an industrial town and cargo port in the borough of Halton, Cheshire, England. Runcorn is on the southern bank of the River Merseille, where the estuary narrows to form the Runcorn Gap. The area's population is around 62,000 residents. To give you all some more context on the place that Alan worked at, I found this company statement on their website. It reads, Piranha Moldings are manufacturers of specialist whitewater kayaks. They are designed by our international team and built in Britain. Piranha kayaks are designed and built to the highest standards to be used by the most demanding paddlers on rivers across the world for river running, creaking, and freestyle kayak. Alan, at the time, had worked for the company for close to 12 years. It was backbreaking work, but he loved his job. One of the biggest reasons Alan enjoyed going to work every day was that his wife, daughter, and future son-in-law all worked for the company. It was 7 a.m. and Alan and his future son-in-law were sitting in the break room. They were discussing Christmas and the pure excitement of getting to share all the gifts they got for one another in just a couple of days. As their conversation came to an end, it was time to get to work. Alan's future son-in-law, Mark, would head up to the control room while Alan made his way down to the factory floor. Alan's job was to make sure all the machinery that the factory used to mold and build the kayaks was clean and fully operational. Alan had been maintaining the machinery for quite some time, so it was easy to say that he knew every piece of equipment inside and out. Alan's attention was soon focused on checking out the different molding rooms within the factory floor. One of these particular molding rooms Alan knew was shut down at the time. It had recently had an issue with its circuit board, and thus the company's leadership had made the decision to shut the room down. As Alan approached the room and looked inside, he noticed it was in dire need of a good cleaning. When kayak molds were placed within these molding rooms, a lot of the time, excess plastic would seep out of the molds and end up getting caked to the walls within. As Alan looked around inside the room, he made the decision that now was as good of a time as ever to get this molding room cleaned up. Alan would leave the room and go and fetch his crowbar. He then proceeded back into the molding room and began chipping away at all the caked on plastic within. Alan would chip away at plastic for a few moments before suddenly the door to the molding room would slam shut, leaving Alan in complete darkness within. Alan would immediately know that he was in a dire situation. The door shutting signified to Alan that the circuit board must have been repaired. If the circuit board had been repaired, then that would mean the molding room he was now locked inside of was fully operational. Up in the control room, Alan's future son-in-law Mark was standing in front of a large switchboard that controlled all of the equipment out on the work floor. Soon, a particular blinking light on the switchboard got Mark's attention. The blinking light was for the molding room that Alan had been cleaning out. As Mark looked at the light, he knew that this meant the broken circuit board had been fixed to this particular room. Not even giving it a second thought, he instinctively flicked the on switch. When he did, the molding room began its restart process, locking down the door and subsequently trapping Alan inside. Panicked and in the dark, Alan now took his crowbar and ran to the door of the machine. He knew time was against him as he desperately tried to pry the door open. When that didn't work, Alan did the only thing he could think of. He started to scream for help while banging on the doors and walls with his crowbar. His panicked brain was screaming at him to get out. You only have mere minutes to get out. 
Out on the factory floor, workers continued on about their day. The noise of the machinery within the factory made it impossible for anyone to hear Alan's cries for help. As Alan continued desperately screaming and banging around, he noticed the walls inside begin to turn red. This molding room was basically just a giant oven. An oven that would reach temperatures of almost 600 degrees in under 10 minutes. As the temperature continued to rise within, the floor began glowing red as well. Gaining temperature, Alan soon had to let go of the metal crowbar as it too was getting too hot to hold on to. Alan would continue frantically banging against the walls, but each time Alan's skin made contact, it would burn him to increasingly severe degrees, leaving bits of himself charred to the walls of the oven. Pretty soon, Alan's shoes would begin to melt, and in pure agony, Alan could no longer stand or even breathe due to the intense heat that was engulfing him. Out on the work floor, no one would know something was wrong until black smoke started to pour from within the molding room. When the smoke was seen, the room was shut down and the door was finally opened. Alan was found, but by this point, it was far too late. He had already succumbed to one of the most horrible fates imaginable. In the aftermath, an investigation took place to figure out what went so horribly wrong. I will read you all some of the findings now. Martin Haywood, the investigating inspector at the Health and Safety Executive, said, The doors were set to automatically close whenever the electrical supply was switched back on, which meant there was a high risk of someone being trapped inside. There had been no risk assessments and staff had not received suitable training on how to use the new ovens and there was no written instructions on cleaning or maintenance. If piranha moldings and the individual prosecuted over Allen's death had properly considered the risks to employees when they designed, installed, and operated the ovens, then he would still be here today. Five years after the incident, the kayak company was found guilty of corporate manslaughter and fined 200,000 pounds. The molding rooms were designed with no escape hatch and basically no safety precautions whatsoever. In looking at what happened and how the company went about its day-to-day, -day, it seems like it was only a matter of time before a tragedy like this ended up taking place. My deepest condolences go out to Alan Catterall, as well as all of his family and friends. Margarita Liga was a 41-year-old wife and mother of two from Fiav. Biav is a small town in the northeastern Trento region of Italy. It was July 4th, 2024, and Margarita and her family were hiking in the Klaska Castiglione mountain region. From all reports, they were on their way to spend some time at a cabin in the area. From my research, there are only a handful of private homes in the hamlet of Drocala. Drocala is where the cabin the family was heading to was located. In order to get there, the family had to travel using a cableway that connected the Olino hamlet with the Drocala alpine pasture. From my research, the cableway travels a 1300 foot or 400 meter distance over an extremely steep gully. As the family arrived at the cableway around 11 a.m., they approached the cable car that was intended for luggage only. Margarita would begin loading her family's luggage when her clothing became snagged on the cable car. Before she could free herself, the machine suddenly switched on, unexpectedly, and Margarita was soon hanging on for her life. Margarita's family, along with others, looked on in horror as the contraption carried her 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 yards over a cliff edge. Margarita continued to hang on for dear life but at around 50 yards, she could no longer hold her weight. She looked one last time in the direction of her family before her hands were forced to let go. The wife and mother of two would then plummet around 500 feet to the unforgiving ground below. What makes this story all the more horrifying is that Margarita's husband and two young ones had to watch on in horror as their mother was taken from them. Following the tragedy, an investigation was soon underway. 
At the time of recording this, the investigation is still ongoing, and I was unable to find any details as to why the cable car began moving when it did. Whatever the reason, a family was horribly scarred in the midst of a trip that should have brought them all nothing but joy. As always, my deepest condolences go out to Margarita as well as all of her family and friends. For this next story, we will be heading to Manitoba. Manitoba is a Canadian province bordered by Ontario to the east and Saskatchewan to the west. It is Canada's fifth most populous province, with a population of around 1,342,000 residents. Manitoba has a widely varied landscape, from Arctic tundra and the Hudson Bay coastline in the north, to the dense boreal forest, large freshwater lakes, and prairie grassland in the central and southern regions. It was Friday, July 25, 2008 and 15-year-old Andrew James of Manitoba got up in the morning, showered, dressed, and prepared for a day of work. From my research, in order for someone of Andrew's age to work in Manitoba, he had to have applied and obtained a permit from the Provincial Employment Standards Branch, as anyone under the age of 16 is required to do. Andrew James was working for a paving company that was in the midst of completing repairs near an old Manitoba Hydro substation located on Quarry Road. As Andrew and the crew began their day of work, Andrew would soon find himself helping to unload asphalt off the back of a truck. As Andrew continued helping unload the asphalt, tragedy would strike. From all reports, Andrew would suddenly lose his footing while shoveling asphalt from a trailer box into a backhoe scoop. As the asphalt continued to come down, the young man would soon become completely buried under the material. And for those that don't know, hot mix asphalt pavement is usually at a temperature between 275 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Fellow workers on site would soon rush to the aid of Andrew, trying frantically to dig him out. Many of the workers that tried to free him would suffer burns in the process, as emergency services were soon called to the scene. The Stony Mountain Fire Department would soon arrive, and it would take them close to 15 minutes to finally clear the asphalt away. But by then, it was far too late. The fire chief was quoted as saying, We arrived on scene, and there was an individual buried by asphalt. Only his hair was sticking out. Individuals buried in that much fill or asphalt or anything, well, he's deceased. Because your body cannot survive that. The material was so hot, the rescuer's toes were burning inside of their boots. Following the incident, an investigation would take place. The owner of the paving company would end up being fined $33,500 for the incident, with the owner stating that he felt tremendous guilt for Andrew's death as he considered the young man to be like a son. As for Andrew's parents, they have stood by the owner of the paving company and have made it very clear that they hold no ill will towards the man, as Andrew's death was nothing more than a tragic accident. My deepest condolences go out to Andrew as well as all of his family and friends. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode. If you enjoy the content, please hit the like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, if you want to make sure you don't ever miss a new upload, you can turn on the bell notification right after you subscribe. In the description box below, you will also find a link to my merch store and a link to the Cellar Dwellers membership tier for the channel. It's only $2.99 a month, and if you're interested, please take a moment to check those things out. If you'd like to submit your own scary story or any kind of story recommendation that you would like me to cover on the channel, you can do so using the email that is linked in the description box below. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself, so that anything that you do to support the channel is greatly appreciated. And until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into The Cellar. Ah!